The Royal Pavilion, one of the most fantastic buildings in Europe. Extravagant and eccentric, it dramatically reflects the personality of its creator, King George IV. In 1786, George, then Prince of Wales, took up residence in a modest lodging house in Brighton. Over the next 35 years, during which he became Prince Regent and then King, George commissioned the development of the building into a spectacular Indian-style palace. Although it appears to be Indian on the outside, Chinese on the inside, it is actually only a Western interpretation of the East. George never visited either, but loved the exotic, fantastical vision of both. Britain was a very powerful nation at this time, and George may have seen himself as Emperor of the World. During George's visits to the Royal Pavilion, he would play host to many guests who would stay for several days. They would enjoy lavish hospitality, and the building would come alive with banquets, balls and concerts. Progressive ill health and the demands of the monarchy meant that George's visits became more infrequent. His last visit was in 1827, three years before he died. His brother, William IV, succeeded him as king and reigned until 1837. His niece, Victoria, then became queen. Queen Victoria used the pavilion as a royal residence until 1845, when she decided to sell it. She felt she was constantly being stared at by the public, and it was too public a place for her family. 143 wagons of the interior furnishings and decorations were removed and taken to London for the royal collection. In 1849, a bill was brought before Parliament, which would have allowed the demolition of the pavilion and the selling of the site for redevelopment. This measure was opposed by a public petition and a determined campaign led by the town clerk of Brighton, Lewis Slight. The pavilion was eventually bought by the town for £53,000. It remains the only British royal palace not owned by the state or the crown. Within a year of purchase, the pavilion opened to the public. Attempts were made to redecorate the main rooms in the original style, and Queen Victoria returned many items, such as chandeliers, paintings and fixings. Over the next hundred years, the pavilion was used for a huge range of events, from prestigious assemblies and balls, a tea room, to bazaars, baby contests, flower shows, and even a flea circus. Writers such as Oscar Wilde and William Thackeray gave lectures. In 1861, Brighton Museum opened in the pavilion, and in 1866, the town's first library was established here. One of its most extraordinary uses was as a hospital for Indian soldiers during the First World War. At a time when Britain desperately needed to retain the loyalty of India, the Pavilion Hospital became a valuable propaganda tool. Successive monarchs have since returned many of the original fittings and furniture, and those that were lost were accurately recreated from historic sources. However, in 1975, an arson attack on the building left the music room badly damaged and it took some 15 years to restore. But disaster struck again in the hurricane of 1987, when a newly restored minaret dislodged and crashed through the ceiling of the music room, burying itself into the floor. Conservation of the pavilion is ongoing, and you'll often see conservators working on different aspects of the building. In the 1980s and 90s, the surrounding gardens were also reinstated as far as possible to their original layout and planting. John Nash's original plans for the gardens were an integral part of his overall vision for the estate. They show a new ornamental style of gardening, with shrubberies, flower beds and winding paths, in contrast to the 18th century landscape garden, with its emphasis on visual effects rather than flowers. Now let me take you on an alternative tour of the Royal Pavilion, where we'll explore hidden spaces of the palace, through vulnerable and fragile areas that are rarely seen and difficult to access. There are a myriad of walkways, tiny hatches and narrow staircases. We'll start in the cellars, climb up to the domes and rooftops, and you'll see a very different side to the richly extravagant rooms you have seen so far. There are lots of myths about the existence of tunnels under the pavilion gardens. There is actually only one tunnel, which leads not to Mrs Fitzherbert's house in the Steen, as is commonly thought, but to the Prince Regent's stables, which is now the dome. It is 60 metres long, and was constructed in 1821 at a cost of £1,783. 
George had it built at a time when he was very unpopular with the public and was embarrassed to be seen due to his increasing weight. It allowed him to cross his entire estate unseen. The tunnel was also used by servants and for deliveries. It offered hidden access into the pavilion. Following the stairs up through the ground floor and the first floor, you come to a hidden staircase which leads up to a set of rooms known as the Saloon Bottle. There are 55 stairs to climb to reach the pavilion's central dome. It was built between 1817 and 1820. In the summer of 1818, the Prince Regent travelled from London to see the erection of the cast iron structure for the bottle. It was originally intended to be a billiards room, but George seems to have had a change of heart. A suite of four rooms was fitted up instead. The grained doors and the remaining wallpaper date from about 1830. In William IV's reign from 1830 to 1837, the rooms were occupied by the King's nephew, Prince George of Cumberland. In Queen Victoria's time, the rooms were valet's apartments. If you look closely, you can see that many of the walls are covered with graffiti and signatures. Up until the Second World War in 1939, this area was accessible to everyone, and visitors could wander through the almost completely unfurnished pavilion as they wished. Since the 1970s, when much of the building was restored, it was felt appropriate to leave this area untouched. It illustrates what the pavilion must have looked like when the town council bought it in 1850. The oval windows offer a fantastic view of Brighton, although it has changed significantly since George's day. The unfinished oval dome ceiling that was originally intended for this area can be seen above the existing ceiling. Evidently, the area was downgraded in the course of construction, possibly due to George's lack of funds. The saloon bottle is the highest part of the pavilion. Looking down from it, you can see the roof of the pavilion. There is a maze of hidden spaces up here, narrow walkways and tiny doors, which lead into the pavilion domes. Here you can see John Nash's elaborate cast iron framework, which he built over the existing marine pavilion building to support the dome above the saloon. Because Nash could not support the additional storey and new onion-shaped roof on the existing external walls, he devised a cage of iron columns encircling the walls. It was a daring technical stroke, and Nash experimented widely with new materials on an unprecedented scale. It was one of the first domestic uses of iron, having previously only been used in bridges or factory buildings. In the dome above the banqueting room, you can see how the magnificent chandelier is fastened. Suspended from this central point, the chandelier is 30 feet high and weighs nearly a tonne. The Royal Pavilion has a varied and fascinating history, and we hope you enjoy discovering it on your visit today. For 200 years, the pavilion has been bound to the identity of Brighton. Colourful and often controversial, Brighton has grown around the iconic symbol of the pavilion into the city it is today. Designed for entertaining and pleasure, the Royal Pavilion was not expected to last two centuries. Our dedicated team of conservators help ensure present and future generations can enjoy this spectacular palace. You can help us to conserve and protect the Royal Pavilion by becoming a member of the Royal Pavilion. For more information, pick up a leaflet or ask in the shop for details.